Welcome to Functional Philosophy, the show in which I, Charles II, explain and apply Ayn Rand's philosophy, Objectivism. If you'd like to ask me a question on Objectivism or its application, just go to charles2.com slash contact. And my last name is spelled T as in tango, E as in echo, and W as in whiskey. In an ideal objectivist world, how would the government deal with counterfeiting, parentheses, physical property violation, and digital counterfeiting, parentheses, copying and online piracy? Well, both counterfeiting and piracy would be illegal, and that's as far as I'm going to answer your actual question, but I do have a couple comments to make on your question. First, I reject this whole framework of conceptualizing counterfeiting as relating to physical property and then taking piracy to represent the digital version of that. Counterfeiting can be physical or digital. Counterfeiting is just creating an imitation of something and then selling it or offering it as if it were the real thing. That's what happens when you go on eBay and you see that something is shipping from Hong Kong. Oh, here's a Pokemon Yellow cartridge, but you know that is a counterfeit that was not manufactured by Nintendo or under its auspices. But you can do the same thing digitally. Somebody could create a counterfeit version of Microsoft Word, for instance. And that would still be counterfeiting. Piracy, on the other hand, is not counterfeiting. It's just a form of theft. There's no attempt to duplicate a product in a way that makes it not the actual product. You're just taking the product. When you pirate a movie, it's it's the actual movie. There's no, you're not selling uh, an imitation deceptively. Now on torrent sites, you will find compressed versions of uh, pirated movies, but there's no deception there. They're not selling it or offering it as anything other than, hey, this is a pirated version of this movie, and the compression is often a feature that people look for. Oh, here's this game, uh, compressed so it doesn't take up as much space. Now, piracy could be a step in the process of counterfeiting. Somebody could pirate a movie and then burn it to a disc and then sell that disc as if it were the real product, and then that disc and the packaging would be a counterfeit, but piracy as such is not digital counterfeiting. So what you have done here clearly is recognize that there's some vague connection between counterfeiting and piracy. They both involve copying in some sense. <laughs> And then you realized, oh, and counterfeiting usually has to do with physical things like money and piracy has to do with digital things. So then I guess piracy must be the digital equivalent of counterfeiting. Okay, that's a nice tidy framework. I'm done. No, that is rationalism. You cannot just accept something is true because it fits into a nice, neat framework. Now, I say this is rationalism because what do rationalists do? Where do rationalists actually get their extrasensory a priori uh, premises? Well, they're not actually getting messages from God, and they don't actually have innate knowledge, so they have to go by some standard to accept premises, and a common standard is an aesthetic one. Is this nice and symmetrical? But 
aesthetics derives from reality. Something is beautiful because it manifests some, uh, it reflects some uh, basic truth about reality, not the other way around. You don't decide something is true because it looks pretty. Now, this has been common with the rationalists as far back as philosophy goes. The ancient Greeks, or many of them at least, thought that the universe must be spherical because that's the perfect shape. All of the edges are equidistant from the center. There's this nice equality of everything. It's nice and simple and neat. And rationalists often do this. They do exactly what this questioner did. Okay, here's a nice category that sets everything up in this neat framework. So, okay, I'm just going to accept this because it looks nice and neat. But no, reality can be lopsided. Reality can be asymmetrical. Maybe the universe isn't a sphere. Maybe it's bigger on the left side than it is on the right side. You can't just say, well, this, this <laughs> satisfies my desire for tidiness, so therefore I'm going to go with that. And that's clearly what this questioner did. Uh, he noticed some vague similarity between counterfeiting and piracy. They both involve copying and then the digital physical dichotomy. And that allowed him to come up with this framework. And then he said, okay, that makes sense. There you go. But that is completely wrong. Piracy is not the digital version of counterfeiting, no matter how well it fits into some abstract framework. Sometimes things don't fit neatly into a framework. Sometimes things are sui generis, or sometimes something can fit into either of two uh, categories, and it's optional which one it goes in. Now, the other thing I wanted to say was that I should keep a list of the areas people expect me to be an expert in. What was it last week? A pneumologist. Somebody expected me to be able to tell how to determine which factory air pollution came from. I had somebody send me an email recently asking me what he should do about the fact that if he opens a restaurant, a more established restaurant will give free food away uh, on the day he opens to steal his thunder. So I'm a small business strategist now, apparently. Uh, and now, apparently, I'm uh, an intellectual property liar. And, of course, people uh, always expect me to be a physicist of one kind or another. But I am none of those things. I am a philosopher. <laughs> the law of identity tells you things are what they are. It doesn't tell you what everything is. Yes, philosophy deals with the basis of everything, but it doesn't deal with the details of everything. I don't know everything because I know philosophy. So don't send me questions on the assumption that I know the details of everything because I don't. Now, if you have reason to think that I do know uh, the details of some area, then it's fine for you to send me a question. You know I like video games. Fine to send me a question on that. You have some reason to think I might have uh, specialized knowledge there. You know I own a gun. You might ask me something about that. That's fine. But if you have no reason to think that I know anything about a certain area, the fact that <laughs> I deal in philosophy and philosophy is the basis of everything is not sufficient for you to send me a question on that subject. It's not the hassle of rejecting questions. It takes two seconds. I read an email and it says, oh, do you know about uh, air pollution or whatever? I say, okay, I'm not answering this. But it's just ugly and unpleasant and depressing to be treated like a cult leader. I am not coming down the mountain with the tablets on which are inscribed the concrete dogmas you have to follow. That's not my role here. And for you to ask me questions on that assumption, well, it's just ugly and it's 
as I said, depressing because it reveals that you don't actually understand the value I'm offering. I am offering you rational principles, not every concrete application of those principles. So if you want to know about gun rights, then I can tell you that the principle is that it is okay to own weapons that allow you to defend yourself, but once you own a weapon whose scope of destructive power exceeds that required for self-defense, then you have crossed the line, and those weapons should not be legal. Now, what specifically does that mean? What does that mean concretely? How do you apply that? Does that mean a fully automatic rifle should be legal, illegal? How does that apply to pistols, shotguns, whatever? That is for you to figure out. The value I am offering to you is the principle, and then you apply it. Now, if you have reason to think that uh, I've thought about the issue and may be able to help you with the application, I'm happy to do so. I enjoy getting questions like that, but I often get questions that are clearly based on the assumption that I am omniscient and have the ability to apply principles to areas I don't know anything about, and I don't have that ability. Or take drugs. Well, the principle I can offer you there is drugs that enhance your mood or enhance your productivity are fine. Drugs that circumvent the reciprocal relationship between life and happiness are bad. So drinking some alcohol as social lubricant or as part of a celebration or smoking marijuana to relax or find something uh, funnier than you might otherwise find it, that's fine. Uh, sitting in a crack den instead of uh, getting a job is bad, or sitting on your couch with a heroin needle instead of doing something productive is bad. Now, what about this specific drug? That's for you to figure out. I've given you the standard uh, by which you can figure out if a drug is legitimate or not. That is the value I offer you. And so when you ask me these kinds of questions, it reveals that you don't actually understand the value of rational principles. I cannot deduce what to do about a competing restaurant from the law of identity, I'm afraid. Nobody can. That's not what philosophy offers you. Iran has previously indicated wanting to have multiple countries with different governing policies. If you assume that each was objectivist, how much room for difference laws would there be between said objectivist governments? Would a global objectivist UN be the best possible governing situation? Absolutely not. Now first, characterizing a government as an objectivist government I think is wrong. The government wouldn't have any explicit philosophy. It would simply protect individual rights. I don't even think that you would have an objectivist party running the government. I, I don't even think that would be valid. You would have something like a capitalist party. Or if most people were capitalists, you'd have subdivisions of that. But you hear this all the time, people talking about, well, what if you had an objectivist country? I mean, that's fine in the sense that it would be good to have a country where most people were objectivists, although I don't think that would be the case even in an ideal society. I just don't think we would ever get there. I don't think most people will ever be philosophical enough to self-identify as objectivist or as any uh, particular uh, members of any particular school of philosophy. But anyway, how much room would there be for different or variation in the law? Well, there would be a significant amount of variation. 
first of all, it's not obvious how to protect rights in every area. For instance, how do you apply property rights to the ocean? That takes time and experience to figure out. So you could have different countries applying property rights in different ways. And one of those ways may be right and the others may be wrong, but <clears throat> even a country that's committed to individual rights won't necessarily know what the right answer is immediately. So you can have variation in the sense that some countries just don't know the optimal solution right away. There would also be variation in areas that are optional. For instance, the age of majority. This is the most common example of this. Should it be 18 or it could be 19, 17? There's a legitimate range there. There are definite answers that are wrong, definite areas outside of the range of legitimacy. Uh, 50 years old should not be the age of majority. Five years old shouldn't be the age of majority. But within a relatively narrow range, there are options. So it could be different in different countries. And then, of course, there is the issue that is always involved with this question of if people were objective, wouldn't they all just be robots who did exactly the same thing? Well, no, people are different. And objectivity is about a relationship between an individual and existence, or in this case, a country and existence. So in just the same way that being objective doesn't mean everybody's going to be an architect like Howard Rourke, because that's the one thing that's best for everyone because people have different uh, desires and passions and interests wherever they come from. You could have the same thing here. Uh, a different geography, for instance, could result in different laws. Maybe something is legal in one country that's legitimately illegal in another country because of some geographic feature that makes some activity a rights violation. I don't know, maybe you live next to some... Uh, science fiction uh, volcano that spews out fumes and if you light a cigarette the whole continent blows up so then they make uh, cigarettes illegal or something i don't know that's obviously ridiculous but you get the idea so that's just the same principle of i mean different countries and different situations will have different laws now would a global objectivist government <laughs> be the best governing situation. No, one, for the obvious reason that you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. You want to be able to flee a country that goes bad. And if you have one monolithic state in control of everything, well, it's not going to be good if it goes bad. You'll have nowhere to run. But also, there is something to the idea of the American states as laboratories of experimentation. Now, not in the sense that we can experiment with violating people's rights, but in the sense that, as I said before, it's not always obvious how to protect people's rights. So having different states applying different laws and seeing what the results are can be very valuable. So... Yes, there would be significant room for legal variation. And you'd want that variation. So, no, a global government is not the way to go. If you'd like to keep up with everything I do, just go to charles2.com. If you'd like to enable me to do more, just go to patreon.com slash charles2 and become a supporter. Thanks for listening.